Alright guys, AKRX here again and we're back with Dr. Jason Burke and we are gonna be talking about something a bit more casual and something that you all love to hear me rant about. Feathers versus scales. Jay, what do you think? Why is this still a thing? Why is everybody stressing and obsessing about this topic? Boy, why indeed. That's a tough one. Um, I think part of it is... What is a part? I mean, part of it, I think there's a historical baggage to it. Um, people really, for a lot, for pretty much since the late 70s, there was a strong ish push to unite um, birds with dinosaurs to show that they were related and that birds descended from dinosaurs. And that took a long time for the evidence to accumulate. Um, of course, some of the bigger, bigger names in paleo definitely sort of sort of spearheaded it and pushed it forward more. You had uh, Robert Bacher, who, of course, did the Dinosaur Heresies, where he really started pushing that idea um, itself, coming from John Ostrom, who looked at Deinonychus and said, you know, these are starting to look very avian, these qualities. And, of course, you can go all the way back to Huxley, who suggested Archaeopteryx and uh, Coelophysis being close with each other. Or not Coelophysis, uh, Compsognathus. Yeah, Compsognathus, yep. yeah. Um, but... It really wasn't. I mean, it, it, there, the evidence had been accumulating, and then, of course, uh, 1996 r rolled around. We had uh, the discovery of Cynoceropteryx in China, and here was a dinosaur that had a furry covering on it, and it was kind of the sort of linchpin, or the I don't want to say final nail in the coffin because it definitely took a while, but really strong evidence that birds had evolved from dinosaurs. And here was a dinosaur that was close to that line that led to birds that also had this fuzzy covering that was interpreted as probably being early versions of feathers. And I think that's kind of the thing that really sort of pushed it forward. There was a, a at that point there had been a whole generation of people who had grown up with things like di the dinosaur heresies, where there's this real push to really change the way that the world had viewed dinosaurs, sort of away from that more sluggish plotting type to more of these active animals that really were sort of exemplified in birds. And people love birds, so now you associate dinosaurs and birds together. And it's kind of, I don't know, I think it all gets sort of wrapped up into the whole like thing that you have to be, to, in order to be an active and interesting animal, you need to be more close to what we imagine birds and mammals to be so you throw in warm-blooded you throw in fuzzy coverings you throw in anything more birdie related and so i just i think it's sort of sort of struck a chord with a lot of people and so and then there was a sort of push um, i think it definitely got a lot of people in paleo interested um Cynoceropteryx had images from it um so it, it had already been sort of known in the paleo circles a little earlier before, than when it got des got described, of course, because it would have been talked about in meetings ahead of time, and um, people would be passing photos around of it. So everyone already had an idea that some kind of big thing was on the horizon. And a lot of people who were really into that relationship of dinosaurs and birds, which to date is still a very hot topic of uh, dinosaur paleontology, the, the fact that you can now slap this sort of feathery-ish integument on top of a lot of these dinosaurs got all the more interesting. And then, of course, you get paleo artists coming along, and so now there's this option where you don't have to just come up with scales, but now you can do, like, feathery coverings, and I'm not sure which one's easier to do. Um, I know that scales, putting scales on an animal um, artistically can get exhausting if you want to do it just right, um, and feathers might be able to hide stuff a bit more. But I also think that it's associated with... Um, Sort of these these like stereotypes that you know, if dinosaurs are slow plotting lizard like animals and they also were dull colored and you couldn't really show them in active poses, but if they were these really dynamic and colorful animals or these dynamic and fuzzy animals and you could start putting colorful uh, feathers on top of them and start using things like birds of paradise and other tropical birds as your uh, reference point and so you can really start doing these extravagant displays. I think it just yeah, it just sort of spoke to people artistically, and um, it just sort of grabbed the uh, attention of people who were already really into the dinosaur bird connection. So everyone just sort of really got into it. And I think that's the reason why we see a lot of this sort of 
thing with that, which is also why you get this sort of weird dichotomy now with the uh, people who argue against putting feathers on dinosaurs and then the people who want to put feathers on dinosaurs, both of which get their own lovely monikers associated with them. But yep. uh, there's two cults uh, that have ended up, you know, forming. Uh, we are not shy to say that out loud. I've done videos on that before. So yeah, one cult that is less active to, uh, to my knowledge, at least to my experience, quote unquote, awesome bro. You've heard that term before. It's when, you know, things have to be uh, looking this way just because they have to be awesome. There's no other reason for them to look this way other than being awesome. And uh, that's kind of the idea. Uh, the, the thing is, it's a very general term, so we don't know w w what they're thinking. I've seen some awesome bro ideas that are basically interpreted as things, you know, with, uh, like, for example, you have this, you know how in Jurassic World they had this Indominus Rex, right? And... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, the hybrid, the dino hybrid between a raptor, quote unquote raptor, and um, a T Rex, and then it, and it, like it was a big scaly thing uh, with massive claws and weird looking jaws, which I find quite awful, but uh, whatever. Uh, needs and, more um, teeth. Yep. It needs more teeth, yeah, and yet you have these big gaps in between these teeth where you could have fit more teeth in there as well. So, <laughs> would have looked much better, but yeah, okay, never mind that. In any case, and then you have these kind of, you know, spiky, like, quilly things sticking out of them at the same time. So it's not really true that awesome bros are against uh, filaments or feathers necessarily. They're only they're for it if they make things look more awesome. Remember that. And then, we've, of course, we have these feather right, right. You know, lovers. And you know what's interesting? Uh, the, again, quote-unquote, feather Nazis apparently is a thing. And you know why we don't get shy of using this term here? It's because they actually have a group still active and they have a certificate a poster <laughs> which is potentially insulting to some people i presume but uh, you know um i would say not something that we want to associate with when it comes to the community itself something that i think i will have to do another video at one point soon again because it's just been awfully quiet on the channel no drama so we need to introduce some of that but we're not going to do it here you can you can watch that later <laughs> next year there we but, go uh, but this is yeah this is just to get those uh, up to date who are new to the channel and are watching this for the first time that there's like it's gone to these extremes where there are actually two camps uh, you know fighting with one another actively and there are some people in between who are basically the reasonable people like me jason and our crew and others people in the community, like the scientists themselves, who try to uh, set the matter straight. So, and that's what we're here to do. So, uh, Jay, uh, Jay, what do you think about, uh, uh, like, why is it so important to push one agenda and uh, and the other, depending, of course, which camp is, uh, you know, being, you know, is talking, like we're talking about. Why is it so important, like, in your opinion? Why do you think they care so much? I, I cannot come up with a good answer for that, can you? I think a lot of it is personal preference. Um, like I said, there's a lot of people who've sort of grown up now through the dinosaur renaissance who definitely like the sort of more um, avian aspects of dinosaurs. And so anything that pushes that, pushes that, it sounds more political than I mean it to, but anything that sort of shows that will automatically gain more interest that's the feather the, the discovery of feathers or feather like structures happened in theropods uh, definitely helps the uh, get them in the spotlight more because humans in general was, as we talked about earlier are already interested in a lot of theropods just because it's the toothy guys the ones that eat other animals so they sort of automatically get our attention that that's the group that birds came from just uh, I, I suppose in a way it would it makes birds more interesting, um, though birds on their own have tended to maintain interest among people, um, and it, it just sort of yeah just sort of leads down that road to so any pretty much anything that solidifies that relationship of dinosaurs and birds sort of automatically gets boosted just because that's what people are more interested in hearing, or that's what a lot of people are more interested in hearing. And that includes, again, in the scientific community, too, that there's, you know, science itself isn't biased, but scientists will always carry their own biases with them. And there's, and then, you know, there's bias in the other direction, too. There were 
groups of paleontologists who argued for the alt for for the uh, the alternate. There was a strong pushback against the whole um, birds came from dinosaurs movement for a long time, even before we went down to some of the crazier uh, people in the sciences who are sort of still holding on to stuff, regardless of what the evidence says. But that's normal, and I think. I think that tends to get downplayed a bit because when you push back against a new idea, you do sort of get uh, sort of get thrown into that sort of hater camp. Um, but really, it's just you're just trying to be good with the science if you can. Like it's like if this data says one thing, and your interpretation is based within the limits of that data, that's all fine and good. But if you want to extend it beyond the data, that's when you're gonna you should get some pushback. Um, it's always good to argue and to sort of question uh, what's it called? Uh, sort of sort of question what um, any large um, sweeping generalization or any extraordinary claim, right? Every extraordinary claim should have some kind of amazing evidence that backs it up. And ideally, the pa- the the ideas that that sort of stay at the surface and continue on for years are the ones that have have gone through this gauntlet of just getting beaten down by all of the critics because that's where you weed out all the weaknesses. Um, evolution went through that, which is a classic example, which even though there are still some camps that would argue against it, has gone through the ringer many times um, and has come out just sort of hanging on tough. And the bird-dinosaur relationship went through a really turbulent time from the 70s up until the mid-late 90s before that relationship really got um, solidified. And of course, during all that time, you had lots of, uh, lots of data that was accumulating, and it was just weeding out the bad situations, saying, okay, well, did they, did they evolve in the Triassic? Did they evolve in the Jurassic? Are they more closely related to this group of dinosaurs or that group? What are the traits, and how did they, and how did they stack up? We seem pretty, we're pretty good about where we think all of that is now, uh, at this point, we're almost dealing with the minutia of uh, s- uh, because we got really lucky, um, and we have a lot of these great specimens. But we're dealing with sort of the uh, the fogginess of the really in depth relationships, where the data is just always going to be messy. Yeah, there's um, also uh, a lot of the data that's currently. Uh, you know, required to fill in the gaps, like especially when we get to the uh, some of the theropods where there's most confusion, especially, you know, when we start introducing, it's one thing is when we see some consistency, when we see, okay, so we have cellurosaurs and we kind of uh, tempted to assume that uh, based on the vast majority of the evidence that we have found from variety of groups that they would all be uh, sporting some kind of filaments. And then we come across things like Tyrannosaurids, which are, you know, uh, they are branched and currently, according to the current cladistic analysis, they are still w- nested within the cellurosaurs, uh, although it's a very large umbrella term already, but you know what I mean? And yet they are exception to that quote-unquote rule, uh, which obviously causes a lot of uh, craziness. Uh, because obviously Tyrannosaurs being some of the more, you know, famous celebrity dinosaurs in general, especially T-Rex. And yeah, uh, yeah that's when we start getting into heated discussions and debates of whether or not it should uh, be portrayed with filaments, because we don't have any evidence for filaments. I've always been against it, because uh, we. I, the reason why I was against it is because uh, for the same reason you just specified. I... Uh, it, it, it would be going outside of the data to suggest it was filamented unless there is evidence backing it up and we all have the phylogenetic uh, favoring, uh, you know, the most parsimonious, uh, you know, hypothesis is that they were scaly at the moment. There is no uh, other suggestion, to my knowledge at least. And uh, I find it rather easy. For some reason I find it easy. I don't know why it's so difficult for some people to, you know, just accept it, but I find it easy. I used to, by the way, if anybody didn't know that, I used to be pro feather T-Rex camp a while back when it was first suggested before I started digging into the papers a little bit more. 
I used to actually support the idea until I started just scrutinizing it because I just thought it was cool. That was the only reason I supported it. <laughs> I thought it was cool. There was a time I thought it was cool and I just supported it without it actually questioning. Just so you guys know, I've had that period of my life too. So, yeah. there we go. Yeah, there's uh, um, there's that famous... Um, oh, who was it? Oh, his name is getting Charles. Charles Hualio. Uh, well, there's no? that. Uh, well, I was going to say there's that famous um, painting that um, Charles Knight did uh, for Edward Cope's work with the two Dryptosaurus fighting and one's jumping on top of the other. It's like, that's a yep. great, that's like, that looks cool. It's amazing. That's dynamic. We have zero evidence that that ever happened. Like, how do you even show that that could happen? But it's really cool looking. It's, and that's a tough one. It's like, you can do cool art showing a potential behavior. Um, you just can't say for certain whether or not it happened. And so that's Behavior not so bad. Is, uh, seems to be the hardest one to prove in any case, unless you have something real, really conclusive, like you would have. Even then, uh, what you might think is conclusive is very difficult to prove, regardless. Yeah. Like uh, we we have some evidence of triceratops jousting, apparently, you know, doing the duels because there are traces of their own horns on the frills and stuff. There's like T. Rexes and other pteranosaurids engaging in fights we have because we have marks you know from right other exactly so th there's that stuff basically that we know and uh but there's a lot of other stuff we don't know so and it's all fine and good to do um paleo interpretations of it uh writing about it in fiction novels um it's just when we go down to the nitty-gritty and we want to be scientific about stuff and we need to and we want to talk about what we know for certain such and such that's when that's when dinosaurs get less glamorous because that's when we have to take stuff away that looks really cool, but that we just really can't say one way or another. And so it sort of gets rid of some of the glitz. And sometimes it uh, makes the scientists a bit of party poopers. But uh, oh, yeah. that happens. It's, it's uh, yeah, uh, I'm the party pooper. You know how Arnold Schwarzenegger quote from <laughs> <laughs> Kindergarten Cup <laughs> just came to mind. Well, I grew up on that stuff, so that I always have this call kind back of... I was not random. expecting. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> So what's um, uh, this is another thing that we uh, come to now is that uh, the trends uh, you see they are currently very interesting like I see a lot of people uh, obviously getting into citing uh, blog posts as if they are uh, and uh, passing them out as if they are you know the actual science knowledge but to my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, because that's of course why I partially why I invited you to get a word from inside, you know, of the field. Uh, why 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 is it important for us to differentiate between when somebody is writing a blog, aka sharing their thoughts and opinions and discussions, however good and great they may be, versus actually having a published scientific material which went through an extensive amount of testing and peer review, which the blog posts do not go through. Why is it important? For us to not get these two mixed up and put on the same scale bar yeah um i say yeah you covered a lot of it right there um if it's if it's published and it went through peer review that means that in theory at least it's gone past a couple of other reviewers who are in the same field who can point out weaknesses in either the argumentation or in the scientific method itself that got worked out before it got published or just it didn't get published at all. That's also the reason why you see um, a lot of not completed story or not completed studies um, shown in poster presentations at various meetings such as the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting because this is where scientists are going to go to actually throw out their ideas and uh, sorry, so toss out some ideas and show what they're currently working on and get feedback from others in the field about how to fix such and such, uh, maybe where to get more data, etc. Uh, blog posts are fun and great. And yes, there are quite a few out there that are very well researched and have lots of good references backing and supporting their claims. But ultimately, they are basic, they are a, a self published paper that doesn't usually go through peer review, it might hit the general um, public consciousness or the scientific consciousness and if there's comments allowed on the on the blog you might see some back and forth with those in the field that can actually help to strengthen or weaken the overall arguments but the blog post itself is usually the thing that will get shared and not so much the blog post followed by a little note saying check out comment number 13 
So it's really easy to sort of let that slide by. Blog posts also are easier to write. You can knock them out a lot faster. Since you're not going through the review process, it's pretty much just your own work and you bring it out there. So it's interesting to watch how ideas can um, get sort of get molded and honed um, by following how a blog post uh, might sort of undergo iterations or how uh, entries in that blog might change over time as they get feedback. But I would be re- I would be reluctant to cite anything on it. Um, aside from, I mean, if you're, I guess if you're in a discussion and you want to say, well, this person came up with this interesting idea, just remember that it's not, even if it's from someone in the field, unless it's actually gotten through and it's actually become a published piece of work, it's still ultimately equivalent to saying this is what this person said versus this is an actual scientific study that was done. In other words, we still have to differentiate between somebody else's op- somebody's opinions and uh, what is actually accepted as scientific knowledge. Because peer review, uh, we will talk about this in a minute about some of the potential you know problems where peer review might have. But peer review itself, it gives its best that it can to potentially protect us from bias. Yeah, it's a it's the first sort of the first stopgap, like the or the first uh, hurdle that a paper. How, well, okay, that a study needs to go through. It has to show that it's at least scientifically sound before it can get out there. And there's, like I said, there's plenty of things that have slipped by peer review or make you say, how did that happen? Uh, having been on multiple papers, I can say there are instances where sometimes stuff gets, where sometimes even your own work seems to get through because the editor couldn't find enough pe- enough reviewers or their people that they chose to review are not um, quite all there in your field, and that's the thing that can that can happen a lot if you get into more specialized fields, because the more specialized your field becomes, the less other people there are available to review your work until eventually you are your own expert in the field. Um, but yeah, there are are other associations um, with peer review that can get ish, that can get iffy, such as running your own journal and then sort of just letting your friends put stuff in there. But this is usually stuff that becomes well known in the field and people learn to steer clear of. And then even if it gets past peer review, the important thing is that, like I said, that's that first step just to show it was scientifically sound. After that, the real the real battle for the idea comes when the community has a chance in large to read it and offer their opinions on it. You can get different um different responses back in the journal itself or in other journals, and that can last over many, many years. A classic example of that in paleontology was the, wor- was the as far as I can tell, continued back and forth uh, between uh, Kevin Padian and, um, oh, I'm forgetting names now, Scott Sampson was one of them, but uh, Darren Nash was on a couple of them. But the, basically the back and forth over whether or not the visual structures in dinosaurs were for sexual selection or were they for species recognition. And there's something like nine different papers where they're just back and forth with the yes, no, which is interesting to watch. Um, ultimately, it's interesting because the, the very just, question itself just very confusing. Like, I don't even think of how can you even prove wh- why it would be one over the other. It's why, and also very how difficult. are two mutually exclusive. Yeah, and they might not be mutually exclusive. Um, the, the question is whether or not there's enough data there to say one way or the other. And I think the fact that there's been about nine different back and forth papers really suggests that the data just can't say one way or the other. And so you pretty much just pick your poison at that point. Uh, yeah, it uh, reminds me of this classic, you know, uh, Catch-22 or whatever, you know, like number nine slash six, you know, argument where two people across the table, you have a number six and the other person is arguing that it's a nine while this guy is arguing that it's a six. Right. Well, they're both technically right. <laughs> that doesn't mean it's excluding the other possibility. <laughs> Equal ground still and they cannot prove to another that it's a... Yeah, there, there are lots of things like that. I can see where you're coming from. So what are the, uh, what would you say were the um, uh, important aspects of uh, where 
let's just say w w what is important to note when it comes to where peer review can go wrong technically like because there are obviously there's got to be some kind of flaws uh, since it's obviously the best we have but it's not particularly golden and uh, right are there any thoughts in your opinion that could potentially improve this uh process in itself and whether or not it's actually necessary in your personal opinion again uh definitely think it's necessary because again it lets at the very least it lets um it's that sort of again it's that that first gate you got to get past and it just it lets you take care of any sloppiness in the uh in the way that the paper was done or in the way the study was done i mean there are issues associated with it the issues being you can wind up uh typically you get about two or three reviewers um and you can wind up with two or three bad reviewers or just one particularly bad reviewer who just shoots the paper down because they don't like they feel philosoph they philosophically just don't agree with how the with the uh overall the outcomes of the paper versus just its scientific merit and then that depends on how much that can rely that that can result um in sort of a decision by the editor um oftentimes if you get one or two rejections back from the reviewers and the editor will just say sorry it's just not going to work and you have to find somewhere else um, there are instances that have been known in the past where papers have gone through because someone was friends with the editorial board, and so it never really even gets through. It really goes through peer review. Um, those papers usually stick out like a sore thumb, um, and it's more of a blight on the journal's credibility than anything else. Then there's the pa there's cases where a thing will go in for review, but it's more of an in-house review because the people in charge run the journal. So they just can just publish their stuff straight through there, and it becomes this uh, really like speedy avenue to get stuff, get publications out there. Um, so the next hurdle to get through is whether or not anyone else in the community is going to care. And you, like I said, you can get the back and forth that we saw with uh, Padian, Nash, and others, where they were just going back and forth on that. Or you can just get completely ignored, which can happen a lot too. So if it's a bad paper that probably shouldn't have been published in the first place, then it'll just never get cited and it'll just get forgotten about, which is kind of the other way of handling it. So those are, those are usually the, the ways that it tends to happen. Um, ideally, if a paper is controversial, then they, it will receive responses back from others in the field and then that'll sort of get the discussion going and that can wind up actually producing a lot of really great science. Um, everyone's very familiar with Robert Bacher's work. Uh, he's... His publication record has never been that stellar, though he has done a lot of more uh, sort of um, common language or more uh, for the general public style stuff, which has gone over great. Um, but one of the things that he's really been good at doing is being has been like an agitator. He's the first person. I mean, even though John Ostrom was the first to really sort of revive the whole idea of birds coming from dinosaurs, it really was Bacher's straight up. Uh, sort of like spearheading of that and sort of like really blowing it up and, and throwing out all these various extremely controversial ideas that did not have the best scientific backing behind them that really just sort of stoked the fires in paleontology and got people to do more work and to question more of what we originally thought about dinosaurs or about animals in general. And so one of the collateral effects of the dinosaur renaissance, aside from changing how we view dinosaurs, is that it actually really boosted our knowledge of how modern animals work and how they live in their ecosystems just because just because you got a bunch of hot-headed scientists wanting to prove the other wrong which can sometimes wind up producing a lot of really great science yeah there's uh, there's obviously a, some kind of degree of wisdom that if you are able to conduct a very good debate you might actually learn more than you would lose the time conducting the debate so it will pay off yeah I mean, Jack Horner is another person who definitely gets a lot of hate and vitriol in the paleo community, in the like amateur paleo community. But his controversial ideas did did wind up producing a lot of really cool biomechanical work on Tyrannosaurus rex and its biting abilities and things like jaw strength and um, sort of what we would expect. Like really asking questions about okay, what are the what are the criteria for a scavenger versus a predator 
and how well can we separate that out and what kind of evidence will we even find in the fossil record to show one way or the other. And again, in large part because Horner just went out and said, it's, you know, it's a scavenger, deal with it. And so it pissed off enough people that we wound up getting a lot of good science out of it. Yep. It's, it's basically, uh, the funny part is that he actually, if I'm correct, um, in my history class here, oh, in that terms, <laughs> uh, he actually admitted uh, to never fully believing that idea. He did it partially, it was obviously as a part of the interview for Jurassic Park 3 project that he was involved in, in 2001. And it's kind of where I remember it's kind of, it blew up cr like crazy because everybody was going absolutely uh, like bonkers about, you know. Yeah. How could Spinosaurus kill a T-Rex? Heresy, you know, impossible, you know, like... <laughs> and uh, there was, like, all this kind of in crazy stuff going on ever since then, and uh, uh, 20 years later or whatever, <laughs> still sometimes people get heated over this. But, yeah, we... Um, it took him to just basically throw it on the table, and while he was probably... Uh, once in a while, you know, just uh, throwing some matches into the gunpowder stock, uh, everybody and eating popcorn, everybody else was having a go. <laughs> right. So you can get some good science out of it. But yeah. Um... Lots of useful stuff, though, came out because lots of questions. It, it forced to ask a lot of important questions, which nobody was asking before. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes sci There's uh, there are famous quotes about it, but, you know, it's like when everybody agrees with your position, it's time to reevaluate your position, right? Like, it's just because that's what, that's like the party line doesn't mean we should always accept that that makes it true. We should always ask, well, okay, why is that, you know? I mean, that we can extend that to like crazy levels of things too. It's like, oh yeah, you know, gravity brings things towards the center, but does it really? And then of course you look and you see there's mountains of studies that show, yes, it does that. But it's good to see that there's studies that always test it because sometimes there's been many cases where you look back and you see, you know, the uh, classic example was uh, Stegosaurus had the brain the size of a walnut, which was an off, a, an offhand remark that scientists made at one point, like in a newspaper. And it just now it is like common, common knowledge that Stegosaurus had this small brain. But really, it was just like an offhanded remark that just someone latched onto well there's another interesting offhanded remark and I, I i think that's never going to actually happen because we already have proof of otherwise but just to give you a bit of you know something for you know to give you trouble sleeping uh, <laughs> there have been actually there, there have been depictions of um <clears throat> feathered stegosaurus <laughs> yes yes there are <laughs> and that is that is that other trend that we definitely see right now, um, and it is partially to blame by paleo because there are definitely some in in paleo who are are very uh, encouraging of putting filaments on various different dinosaur groups, um, even if the data isn't quite there yet. And there's, and then the, the questions come down to okay, what is the conservative position? Is that to say that they didn't? And that they were scaly versus to say that they were all ancestrally filamented. And that's become sort of that heated topic right now, whether or not we can really push feathers back to every dinosaur or in the case of the latest paper that came out this week to every archosaur that's closer to dinosaurs. And that's a toughie. Um, I would say that it's generally there is a tendency to over feather things right now. Uh, it's kind of the hot topic. Yeah, it's called it's the, the, the influffing. Yes, the influffing. And it would be nice to see it yeah, die cause down. Because we, we, we want them to be cuddly and cute. We, 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 don't wanna, we don't want them to murder us or look like they want to murder us. They, we, want to, they want to look like, you know, we want them to look like, you know, like something we can hug, like teddy bears. Yeah. I, I, or, although you wouldn't, you wouldn't really hug a bear, though, would you? Yeah, well, you know... <laughs> I've seen some videos of of some Russian bears that are awfully tame looking, but it might be just this weird thing in Russia. Typically, you don't want to be a friend with a bear. Yeah, there's there's lots of weird things in Russia, unexplainable weird things, right. <laughs> or explainable. But when you hear the explanation, you're like, no way. That just makes more. <laughs> that just adds some more questions. Um, yeah, I'd say yeah. that the other thing is, yeah, um, 
this tendency of the unfluffing that I think that also plays a role in that relationship of birds with dinosaurs, which sort of comes off from that dinosaur renaissance where, again, a sort of collateral effect of that or a side effect is that there's this distinct um, demarcation between the active and interesting animals that are close to birds and then the boring, slow animals that are all like in the generic, they're all reptiles camp. And so if you throw more feathers or feathery things on more dinosaurs, then you get to push them further away from what you typically associate with reptiles. And so it makes the distinction more well, prominent. Yeah. Uh, mm, tough logic here. I mean, sometimes I notice, uh, you know, as, as somebody who runs a YouTube channel, I get to see and I uh, some of my subscribers they uh, like they, they wait specifically like they it's like they know what time I go to bed and they wait specifically for that time they throw something in the comments and say oh check this out have you seen that and I open up and there's like I don't know like a brachiosaurus with all sorts of crazy things that I, I just d didn't even think for one second that you know somebody could actually come up with that and even claim go as far as claiming that that's uh, possible quote unquote and uh yeah having troubles to sleep then thank you subscribers <laughs> i love you too <laughs> so uh, i think um let's get in let's actually try to get a bit more technical okay. uh i think it's time i think we're already we, we had enough relaxing before that for half an hour and now let's get a bit more technical so one of the other heated debates that we've seen uh, quite a lot, and you are definitely aware of them, because you, by the way, for those who don't know, Jason also runs a blog, and uh, I will throw the link in the description. So if if it's a trend to throw blog posts as scientific papers, Jason, we got you. <laughs> we got you. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> but in any case, um, joking aside, you know the debate between uh, can scales and feathers coexist? And if they can, how? And what's the context and why the context here is important from the evolutionary developmental stance? So what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, it definitely, the history of this comes back to early... Uh, at least 70s, if not earlier than that. A, a questions about where feathers came from. The fact that a lot of feathers have this overlapping scale-like quality to them led to um, initial assumptions that feathers are just modified scales that sort of became lighter and fluffier. Um, and then there was some study, there were some evolutionary developmental studies, um, some, what's it called? Um, epidermal, dermal, uh, hybridization studies where you basically take the epidermis of one animal and you stick it on the dermis which is both of these are like layers of skin so one of them is the outermost layer the epidermis and then the dermis is sort of the sort of middle-ish layer so you'd stick one on top of the other in a developing animal and you sort of cross the species barrier and you see what develops from what and that gives you an idea of where these cell signals are coming from if it's like a top-down thing or a bottom-up thing and there's lots of fun developmental pathways and hormones to consider when this is happening. But their work, their work was done with that to see whether or not this fail sc this scale feather relationship was true. And we see that there are a lot of structure, there are a lot, a lot of things in common with feathers and scales. They both have, they're both made out of largely beta keratin, which is something that we only see in um, reptiles and birds today. So it's probably something that that group, the seropsid group, um, came up with or evolved somewhere in that group uh, because mammals, ourselves, we only produce alpha keratin, so our hair, our fingernails, it's all alpha keratin. Um, birds and reptiles do have alpha keratin, but they also have this much harder beta keratin, and that's and that's very very simple with that. Uh, beta keratin itself is actually this gigantic multi pro, multi uh, protein family, which is very confusing in its own right. But they have that in common, so it sounds like there'd be some good evidence for that. And then developmentally, we see. That's where it got a little more confusing. Um, Alan, uh, Alan Brush and Richard Prum uh, definitely did a lot of early work on this development in birds and with the discovery of Cynoceropteryx back in 1996, this 
with which was covered in this more of this hair like uh, structure. This led to questions of okay, well, what does the ancestral feather look like, and how would it have started? And their argument at the time was that feathers were actually an evolutionary novelty, so they came out from uh, develop or from the epidermis in a way that is different from feather from scales, and is more similar to what we see with uh, with mammal hair. Um, now, since that time, we've had a lot of more studies, uh, work by uh, Richard Sawyer and. Uh, can't remember the name because the nap, last name is Knapp, so Sawyer and Knapp, um, and who did a lot of evolutionary developmental work, and their data suggests that feathers and scales do share a homology with each other, so they come from the same initial structure. It's just instead of calling feathers modified scales, it's more like the scales get modified super early on, much earlier than before they even look like scales, and so that was a big deal. Um, uh, yeah, so there was, so that led to that, and then there's um, the fact that the uh, the carrot, the beta keratin used to make scales longer than the beta, or, yeah, is bigger than the beta keratin used to make feathers, which suggests that there was this deletion associated event that led to the feathery um, production and scales. Uh, so that led to that, that whole assumption, or that, that's what brings us to this whole concept that, okay, if they're from the same structure, so they all come from the same initial spot, then it's hard for the two to exist at the same time. Um, more evidence of that came from those dermal, epidermal uh, hybridization studies where you took feathers, uh, feather-producing epidermis of a bird, and you stuck it on the scale-producing epidermis on the bird's leg. And what you'd get is you would still get feathers. You'd have feathers that would grow out of the leg. Whereas if you put the scale-producing epidermis of the leg and you stuck it on the feather-producing dermis of the bird's like back, you'd still get feathers. So it always so this this association, um, and then the and then the fact that we have various bird speed, uh, mostly uh, what do you call them? Breeder birds like uh, hen, uh, chickens. Uh, there are some breeds that actually will produce feathers on their legs instead of scales. Um, there's also a couple of pigeons that will do that too. This sort of led to questions of okay, how are these feathers and scales related? There are some instances where you'll have the feathers growing out of like the tips of the scales, um, and so you get what you might call them feathery scales. Um, and this might have led. To, this kind of leads some to say, okay, well, look, here's a case where here's feathers and scales together. Uh, of course, the other classic example is that, oh, well, birds have scaly legs, but they also have feathery bodies, so obviously feathers and scales can coexist. But, of course, you don't usually see scales with feathers in between them or feathers growing out of them or scales growing on the tips of feathers or anything like that unless it's some kind of really weird uh, artificial breed that usually messes things up, like also growing extra um, toes. But this whole relationship between that is because, um, and because of those epidermal dermal interactions, uh, it led to the better study of how the actual scale feather um, process goes, and what's and what particular um, regulatory genes are activated at the time, and what they do. And what the data currently shows is that the scale producing uh, genetic program comes in later in birds so it takes it comes in at a later time and it's always really weak so it's got a really weak signal whereas the feather producing program which is affecting the exact same cell populations is much stronger comes in earlier and unless unless um, you go really really late into development it will always override that scale program but the fact that it overrides the scale program in itself means that in order to get scales on the legs of a bird, you need to actually take this original um, feather program and actually sort of turn it down. You have to, so if the feather, if you imagine like the feather development program is running at 11, then the scale producing program is running at like a three. So you need to push the feather producing program down to like one just to get the scales to pop out. And if anything happens in between, it'll automatically override it and you get these weird feathery scales popping out. So it's not so much that they are that the two structures are coexisting together. It's that one is over is has evolved to override the other. So feathers 
overrode overwrote even the the scale program and then to get scales back on the legs another developmental um or another evolutionary mutation had to happen that actually had to dial back that feather formation program so that the original scale producing program could finally take over again which is why we have this bit where feathers seem to have evolved a second time in birds but the bit where they sort of can be seen together where you get like a feather popping out between scales is in itself something is an event where basically that program was not turned down long enough and so the original underlying make a feather program sort of beats it out again and you get this weird hybrid happening which is very different from saying like you have a feathery back and you have a scaly body which is a completely different thing that we'd have to do where you basically have to turn off this whole cascading event that would have that would originally be happening all across the body. Because the other interesting thing about where we see scales in birds is that it's also one of the places that is the last place to get its integument at all, which agrees with what we see in um, developing alligators where they, the tail to neck region forms scales first, and then the proximal limbs, so the arms and the legs, they start getting scaly, and then the last bit, the the ankles to toes section, is where the scales finally show up at the very end. And it looks like it's that last section that basically that feather developing program got turned down in birds so you can get the scales to pop out again, which would be a lot harder to do something like the feathery back and scaly body because now you have that initial cascade crossing the whole body and you have to find a way to turn off that specific region, but it's all just sort of flowing down at once. Or at least that's how I've been interpreting the data so far. Um, well, we, we can definitely uh, cite it. So I think the, the Sawyer um, uh, paper that you referred to, that's uh, 2003. Yes, uh, Roger Sawyer it? and Lauren Knapp. So. There we go. We'll include the link in the description. I believe I've already cited, cited it before, um, you know, in the history of my channel when I was doing, you know, a variety of video responses to bigger right. panels <laughs> like like trade explainer and like a few others but uh but yeah and roger sawyer uh, has lots of stuff there was too. another so one if you look up his his um yeah. cv or like his papers on research gate he's got a whole collection of uh papers dedicated to this whole evolutionary developing thing there's a, another one i i think we me and you have exchanged about it a while back when we first got actually acquainted it was uh, i think it was duali yes 2009. danielle duali um, she has a great 2009 paper that reviews everything that is currently known about at the time at least about um the origin of hair feathers and scales and she actually had some great work done in the 70s uh, she had a 1973 paper where she did that dermal epidermal kind of uh, hybridization where she's one who actually found out that feather the feather program will always override the scale program which is pretty cool now this is very interesting um and here is why uh, this is where we get to the juice and uh, uh, i think uh, my subscribers subscribers given that they are they love you know the real thing mm -hmm. you know they like the facts well, there are some people who come here to the channel who are not my subscribers. They uh, don't like the facts. They get offended by the facts because it doesn't fit their narrative. <laughs> so, <laughs> because they want feathers for everything. <laughs> but uh, the reason why I said that is there is this common uh, interpretation uh, of a feathered tyrannosaurus that we see with, like, you know, scale, scaly legs, scaly tails, scaly limbs, even scaly you know heads and everything else that has like a gap in there pretty much is feathered or filamented maybe would be the more correct term to use because a lot of them they try to say but they're not really proper feathers they're proto feathers you know so that obviously they must be there so uh, how does that fit how does that model fit into this uh knowledge that we you have i mean i say shared? it wouldn't fit right because from what we know, yeah, because from what we know, the the original develop integument program in these animals is the same if you're a mammal or a bird or a reptile. So they're like the underlying program that puts the integument on top is already there, and it just changes 
in that program that are uh, sort of changing what comes out of it. So it's because it sort of comes down as this cascade, it's a lot harder to just say make islands of areas that would not be affected. So like make it so you have sparse feathering with scales in between, right? We have birds today that have, a classic example I tend to bring up is like ostriches, uh, but you can also do um, vultures, like uh, turkey vultures, where they have pretty sparse feathering on their legs and on their necks and their heads. But in order to do that, they base the, the in that integument program is basically just sort of turned down so far that there's no real uh, what you what they're what are they called epidermal appendages. So it's just bare it's skin. Just bare so skin you either go bare there. skin with some feathers or bare skin with some hair or thanks to many um, herpetocultural breeders now, we know you can also do bare skin with some sparse scaling as well. But what you don't get is scaly skin and then bits of feathers in between or scales on a mammal. Though as far as we know, theirs would be questionable scales with uh, hairs in between. It's always, it's always like the closest we get are um, with armadillos where they have the sort of bony plates that almost look like scales and they have hair popping out in between it. But from what we understand about the development of those bony scales in, um, in armadillos, they come from themselves from this, what they call a glutinated hair. So really tough hair follicles that all, that have all been mashed together to form a uh, structure that superficially looks like scales. It's basically like a beefed up chunk of uh, hairs, essentially that just right. formed. And we know that 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 hair can definitely do that because the class the the best example of a really powerful and dangerous chunk of hair comes from rhino horn, which is all just really tough hairs all glued together to form this sharpened horn. So it's it it's it's showing it's how you can get different uh, integumentary novelties from the same uh, the same basic structure, right? So all of that was hair. Birds have lots of crazy fans and neat things that come off from their feathers, but they're all still feathers. Like there's eyelash feathers, there's bristle feathers, but they're all still feathers. They all have that barb and rachis and barbules and a follicle. It's just how it's all put together. And then, of course, with scales, you have spines, and you have little setae on uh, geckos, and you have little eyelashes on some geckos, too. So lots of variations from the same underlying structure, but you don't really get the mix and matching of a feather with a scale and a scale with, a, with hair or anything like that. It's always just whatever that integument was adapted for something else. So uh, to, to get more into some of these examples, I... Uh... I heard frequently there's this argument that gets brought up that how do we know that these uh, uh, scaly impressions from these theropods are not, are definitely uh, not the ones that are basically capable of producing uh, filaments like, uh, you know, to kind of make that model possible. I'm not saying it's a good argument. I personally don't even consider it an argument personally, but again, that's just me. And I have my own reasons for doing so. But uh, what I want to hear more of is what sort of science can we use to test this idea? Both based, obviously, on the observation, which we already noted and clear, and uh, try to actually see if, okay, let's say if we were to take into account and this model as face value, why would that be impossible or possible? So the question is... Yeah, like, okay, you know how they say, for example, if a Tyrannosaurus has preserved uh, a certain set of uh, right. scaly skin, uh, so we have skin samples, how do we basically prove that these uh, samples in turn do not produce filaments and they uh, have actually only these scales and there's nothing else that has ever grown there? Because some people claim that it's because they didn't get preserved. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, again... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we just, sorry. No, no. I see what you say. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's the kind of the hairy elephant argument, right? And that, right. Elephants. Yeah, the hairy elephant argument. Have lots yeah, that's of the one, that's the one, yeah. really thick skin all over them, but they have sparse feather cover or feather. Jesus, they have sparse. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> <they> have <laughs> <feathers>. <laughs> no, 
They have sparse hair covering. Yeah. Um, and that's a case where we're having hair that is being, if I remember right, actually the, the amount of hair on an adult elephant is pretty much the same amount of hair as a baby elephant. But because the adults are so much bigger, there's larger, there's larger like tracts of just empty skin everywhere. But in their case, it's it's another it's another bit where like here's here's this here's some hair covering. It's a sparse hair covering, and now in between there was nothing, so it's just naked skin. What we're seeing with the dinosaurs, uh, with like the tyrannosaur um, integument, at least as far as we can tell, is we're seeing an integumentary appendage, which in this case is scales, covering up what would have been the underlying skin. We're not seeing just naked skin there. If it was just naked skin, I think the argument that, well, how do we know there weren't some feathers there would be a lot stronger. But because we're having basically that replacement integument, which would be scales, and it's in places that we know would have been um, feathers in other animals, like um, like uh, Deinonychosaurs or in... Uh, even a critter like uh, Euteranus, that's stronger evidence that what we're seeing here was probably covering the whole body. And ultimately, the only positive evidence we have in that situation is the scales. So it makes sense conservatively to say that, okay, that's probably what was found on the body. I mean, it turns out the initial interpretation of how feathers formed in um, early dinosaurs is actually too conser- was actually not as conservative as it should have been, which is weird to say because it's actually very liberal. Um, but like the original interpretation of Sinusoropteryx showed it as this scaly compsognathid that had that feathery filamenty mohawk on it. But as we got more data, it was apparent that actually these filaments were everywhere. Like they were even down to the toes. This was a critter that was just shaggy all over the place, and it didn't really have these separations between scales and feathers or proto feathers. So when it, and that's a strong evidence that again, when this happened, when the mutation that gave some of these dinosaurs feathers or proto feathers, it happened probably in total. Like it just, it just was a mutation in a develop in a regulatory process that took that original make scales program and changed the whole thing to say make feathers. So everything grew out in place where there would have been feathers. And then we see later specimens like uh, Cynornithosaurus that actually dial it back some. So you now see scaly feet, but you still see feathers everywhere, including down onto the snout. So basically the idea is that we, uh, if we were to find, and we already have uh, scales from the body, both from T-Rex as well, as far as I know, uh, because it's like the back of the tail, I believe, from the Y-Rex right. specimen. And there's also other uh, specimens from other closely related Tyrannosaurid specimens, like Tarbosaurus, Batar, the Splitosaurus, I believe it's a Tarosus that had scales. And uh, there's also, from the body, I mean, as well, we got some, I think it was Gorgosaurus yes. and Albertosaurus, uh, for sure. And uh, those came from various regions. We even have the scales, you know, which scaly... Uh, Okay, hold on a second. Dinosaur skin diagram a project, which Josh uh, did. We've talked about it here on the channel a lot of times, and uh, and I know for a fact you were one of the reviewers who contributed to reviewing that um, diagram to check the, you know, validity of the data to make sure that there was no misconception and uh, no, yeah, you know, I think errors basically. Along with obviously other contributors like Dr. Thomas Carr, Philip Curie, and I think uh, it went pretty well Jeffrey too. Well. That's a really good uh, final product right there. And we uh, obviously see from that uh, diagram that there's uh, it's spread around, and the fact that we find it on the body, other than basically limbs, which would be the forelimbs or the uh, hind limbs, already tells us that this animal was definitely not a feathered animal or a filamented animal. Yeah. It was a scaly animal, based on basically the evidence and the uh, work that you have referred to. Now, let's up the game in <laughs> the difficulty level. Let's go, let's just say this was, this to me personally, this all this stuff you just said, although, like, obviously the papers themselves, they are quite lengthy and uh, quite a big volume of work there. 
But on a general term, when you try to break it down, when you just really boil it down to the main conclusion and how it was achieved, it's a recruit difficulty level. Let's go up a bit to the sort of, um, well, let's just say uh, mediocre, uh, you know, medium average okay. difficulty level. So what about Kulinda, Dromios, Zabaikalos? Ah, uh, yes. That one. You know which one I'm talking about. The very, very famous one that everybody likes to throw in. A cute animal, by the way, if it were restored to life. I would I suspect so, yeah. a tiny one and would have been nice to have. Yeah, it would have been cool to have one as a pet, actually. But let's talk about it. Let's find. Let's see what is so weird about it and why, uh, basically, uh, has it been taken out of context so much to the point that people actually use it as example to uh, support that argument right. that both feathers and scales, quote-unquote, exist, you know, on the same animal in that particular Right, so the uh, Kalinda Doromius, strange critter, has lots of weird integument um, types on it, including interesting scalation and then these interesting weird filaments um this is this is good though this is uh what ultimately became a problem starting probably in the late 90s again because right around that time we had found cynoceropteryx we found cynornithosaurus we found microraptor do we find microraptor yes we found microraptor well yeah found microraptor i think it might have been called archaeoraptor at the time which was its own problem uh, and we found uh, like Bipaeosaurus and uh, Caudipteryx. So the collection of feathery-ish dinosaurs has definitely grown. And and the even starting with the first guy, Sinusoropteryx, something was off with the use of the word feather. Because feather meant bird stuff, right? That's what we knew about it before. We had Archaeopteryx that showed feathers. We think of veins. We think of that that barb that runs down, or that uh, follicle with a rachis that runs right down the middle and that has these branches and these barbs. It's very specific shape to a feather. And then we had Sinusoropteryx, and it basically looks like it's covered in hair. And then we find uh, Sinornithomimus. Oh, God, it's killing me. Sinornithosaurus. I keep wanting to say Sinornithomimus. Uh, but we find like Sinornithom... <laughs> sort, uh, killing me. Sinornitho... Round three. Round three. Uh, Dave. It's definitely the one I'm thinking of. Yep, I can't... Sinornith... Sinornithosaurus. There it is, yeah. Let's just call it thinking. Dave. Okay, yeah. Now. So we find okay. him, and okay, we start to go, see... And we find Codipteryx, and we find... Okay, well, now we have... Kind of looks like fur, but instead of like this one follicle shooting out it's now got these little side branches popping out of it it looks more branchy and some of them look more branchy and barby and now we have um codipteryx that actually has full-on what we would call feather feathers and that tail fan and we find a bunch of other guys that are starting to show that but the original but the original stuff we're finding pretty much just looks like hair some of it's really long but ultimately it just looks like hair um, so that led that's what led um, Alan Brush and Richard Prum to actually start to nail down what is a feather and what are the stages that led to feathers. And so that's what really we started getting the idea of proto feathers or these like precursor feathers, structures that are not feathers but would have been ancestral to feathers. And that's where you got the stage one, stage two, stage three, two B, and so on. A lot of different stages, and that's great, but. Too, I think too, problem, part of the problem is too many paleontologists were not being uh, rigorous enough in their definitions. And so it became, is it fuzzy and is it on a dinosaur? If it's fuzzy and it's on a dinosaur, it's a feather. And it doesn't matter how, uh, what do you call it, how like um, complicated the structure is, it's just a feather. So in the case of Sinusoropteryx, in the case of uh, Bipaeosaurus, for the most part, pretty much all those really basal Solurosaur guys, really away from Manoraptora, you have what looks more like fur. And then come around, I think it was 1999 originally. God, was it 99? Uh, let me just find that out real quick. But we had uh, that study by Mayer, not study, but that um, discovery by Mayer, 2002. Um, of, of Cetacosaurus. Uh, that, that specimen of Cetacosaurus right, that was yeah. found with these weird filaments coming off of its tail. 
And at that point, it was 2002, we already had all these other theropods, Insularosauria, in Manoraptora mostly, that were showing structures that everyone was pretty on board with calling feathers or at least pre or at least proto feathers and now here's another dinosaur that's really 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 far away from the origin of birds and it's also showing this filamenty stuff but at this point everyone's calling anything with a filament on a dinosaur a feather so now all of a sudden Cetacosaurus shows signs of feathers then we go to Tianyu Long a couple years later the uh, heterodontosaur nope the hypsilophodont and uh, I think so. Is it like oh no, he's a heterodontosaur. Sorry, and then Hypsilophodont is Calendrodontus. Yeah, so a heterodontosaur yeah, 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 uh, Tianyu Long, which also is found to have these really long, really quills is a better word for it because these are pretty thick structures. Um, but they're being called feathers too. And then finally we come to Calendrodromius now, and we see it's being with its weird filament branching, also being called feathers. And so I think the biggest problem is. When people, if people are going to argue, well, look, here's feathers and scales um, coexisting together, the first question that should always come up is, are those feathers? Is this at all in relation to the feathers? Because one of the other great studies that Roger Sora came up with back in 2003 was the discovery that not everything that is a filament on a bird is a feather. Uh, his work with uh, Lauren Knapp, again, from right, showed that the uh, bristles on a turkey beard which are these weird structures that stick out of the chest of male turkeys, and apparently the girls love it, uh, are, not, are not feathers. They are filamented. Yep. They have um, – that looks like a, it looks like a rachis or something in the midline, and, but they grow pretty much straight out of the epidermis and look in a structure that looks much more similar to how fingernails grow. And so they don't have a follicle or anything like that. But they still – they still um, express feather beta keratin. So if we were to just do a, spectra, a spectrometer and uh, like a spectroscopic analysis on it, it would pop back with feather beta keratin and you'd say, oh, well, that's a feather. So that's been an issue. Uh, now we know that feather beta keratins also exist in developing crocodilians, so developing alligators in some of those early cell lineages before they turn into scales. That we see some feather beta keratins coming up there. So really, feather beta keratin is a badly named beta keratin family because it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with feathers. It's just what a lot of feathers happen to express. So it's mostly a, it's a beta keratin largely associated with feathers, but is not a requisite, like not everything that has it will have feathers. So we have these filaments on these different dinosaurs. The big deal is Calendodromius, Chanulong, and Cetacosaurus. Their filaments are all pretty thick, and they all really don't agree with the original interpretations of how feathers develop, because for the most part, they're all just these long cylindrical structures, much more akin to hairs. They don't really do the kind of branching pattern. Calendodromius definitely has these weird branching scenarios that are coming out, but it's worth noting that the, the um, authors of that paper were unable to associate those branches with the type of um, feather, proto-feather stages seen in Manoraptors, which, again, is a sign that you're probably this own weird, interpret this own weird side thing that's coming out. But the fact that those structures happen to be in the same place on the body where we also see scales nearby. To me, I read that and I say, okay, well that tells me that they're probably not feathers or at all related to that feather development program and that this is a this is an integumentary type that is unique for these group, but it's coming out somewhere similar to what we see with the turkey beard where it can just grow straight out of the skin as a separate development. So it's not overriding any kind of scale development program. It's just its own weird side development that we don't really know too much about but the big deal is that it's not really from what we can tell from its overall structure and its placement and the fact that it's very far removed from birds i think it's a stretch to call those structures feathers and i actually think it's a disservice to do so because ultimately all it does is dilute what the word feather means because ultimately like the original interpretation of feathers, and you see it come up time and time again in these papers, is feathers are the most complicated integumentary uh, type that has ever, that as far as we know, has ever developed, has, that nature has ever developed. But as soon as we start saying that the feathers on, that are that um, these sort of early proto feathers with just some similar some simple branching are also feathers, 
Well, now it's not the most um, complicated integumentary type. It just happens to lead to one of the more complicated ones. And now we're saying that these structures in Sinoceropteryx or in Uteranus that are basically just these long, thin filaments are feathers. Now, it's really hard to say what you mean because now you're, you're, you're saying that a structure that is almost indistinguishable from a mammalian hair is also a feather. So now are we going to, so now, so now if theoretically, if we were to find like Rapanamus, the Cretaceous um, mammal, the one that was caught eating a Cetacosaurus baby, uh, we find that guy and we see he basically it's like there are some kind of appendages to those scales of sword and they are all see they all seem to be located specifically restricted to this location uh, you know closer towards the center of the body so as you start going towards the tail and limbs and like head and you know neck and stuff you start kind of they start disappearing so uh, this is this is what this is what i find personally quite interesting about calling the dromius and uh, my question was do you believe it might be the case that we're not taking into account the fact that as those animals went extinct that this certain unique um, example of a structure which we just don't see any uh, living analog of went extinct with them for good basically oh yeah definitely possible if this and, and it's always a worry because now we're running into structures that have no modern equivalent, and so it becomes more difficult to say for certain um, exactly what they're made out of, or uh, yeah, like what their makeup is. We can't say anything really about their development because our specimen count is usually one. I mean, in the case of Calendodromius, you got lucky; we have a whole bone bed full of them. But yeah, nailing down that developmental process is really difficult and having it basically be this unique one-off, which it does seem to be with Calendodromius because again, other than the stage one protofeather, which is basically hair, none of these other structures seem to line up with any of these other of the protofeathers you see in mammal in uh, manoraptors. They're just these sort of weird other things. The interesting part about it is that obviously with these um, uh, more primitive fil filaments that we see on the mini raptors, they don't quite grow in the same manner, at least based on the preservation quality that we can tell. Uh, comparison to Colin the Dromius, like they're still different. That's the interesting and funny part. They're not uh, quite identical, and hence why I've always been quite 
I mean, I always recommended caution when uh, making these kind of assumptions and actually trying to apply this as a general rule that all dinosaurs where we don't have the evidence for it might have had it because, you know, we have this one example that it had it, but I think it's important to differentiate between what could be a potential exceptional example where we have something unique and we don't even know what it was for. We don't know how it was used. And uh, we also know, based on what we have from the samples so far, this was not a common thing. Like, not at all. Yeah, I mean, it's, very, this kind of arrangement. it's a very strange arrangement. And it's it's one that ultimately we just need more analyses of the specimens to really gain more information on what's going on here. Because it's... They're very strange. Tianya Long is one that would, would be great to see some more stuff from because it was kind of written about and forgotten, which is unfortunate because it's got some weird stuff on there. It's nice to see that this Attackosaurus specimen has gotten another look at recently. Uh, so it's good to see that that, and yeah, again, their, their data suggests that it is not, um, while they do think that it is originally from the tail, they don't think it is associated at all with feather development. It looks more similar to that turkey beard, or actually they had an example of, uh, I think it's something coming off of um, the rails, the, the bird's rails. Uh, it's a weird structure off the top of their head, which birds did some weird stuff. Yeah, it's like a secondary kind of derived appendage that just, it like it doesn't fit within the feather itself is just something of its own entirely which is usually unique to the species or uh, it was peafowl that, that was it kind of Con you know, congo peafowl which have just these open. weird either single or multiple filaments just coming right off the top of their head i don't think it looks particularly hot but apparently the female birds think otherwise well uh, yeah, i mean i can i can only attest to the fact that maybe we we have our own things that we find attractive, which probably yeah, birds don't care about uh, either unique. if we ask them. I'll say that. It looks like <laughs> one of the examples they have from the mayor paper looks like uh, the poor bird got struck by lightning. And so now its hair's all standing on end. Great times. Oh. Great times indeed, yeah. The other thing I think that people for frequently forget to um, realize is that we also haven't ruled out, like we haven't had any way to test, to rule out the possibility of whether or not uh, this presence of these weird structures could, like you pointed out, be something right. to do with Right, it's always possible. Um, we might have a chance to say one way or the other with Calindodromius because we have that bone bed. Um, but at the moment there's just a single paper on it, so... Hopefully we're getting more studies coming out of it soon, because it would be great. I think it's uh, also the fact that it's uh, from Russia, and uh, we don't have a lot of Russian material. I mean, there are still, I mean, I was going to say not a lot, but there's still been quite a number of papers published from Russian material. And uh, there's this um, Volga Titan as well, the sauropod that was uh, found in... Uh, uh, Russia as well recently that it's a, it's like it's a very interesting thing of its own it's a topic for another time I guess but it's in case you haven't seen it I strongly advise to have a look as well because there is something significant about it but I need to kind of give a proper read to it to understand where they're coming from but there there's something interesting oh definitely and I, I I suspect Volga Titan. when ideally when the politics get worked out that we might have a sort of like a second asian revolution in dinosaur studies because i feel like a lot of stuff in russia is just untouched right now and that there's probably a lot of really great stuff there that's just no one has the material or the uh the funds to actually get out and find like even the kalinda dromia specimen if i remember right was found in a pretty remote region um, of russia so it was really hard to get that to the local museums yep it's a uh, it's one of those areas which is kind of more like the wild sort of areas and um, to give a better understanding uh, to those who are new to the channel if you go back to one of my other videos with um, when, when me and Josh do the interview of uh, with um, uh, Dr. Tim King who was actually participating in this expedition to look for mammoths in uh, Siberia so uh, you will get a very good idea of basically what it's like in terms of the environment and how kind of 
you know, cruel and unfriendly it can be, you know, when it comes to uh, digging for stuff. So that's just to get a bit of an insight to that. And uh, the other thing as well I wanted to mention, and I don't think we've ever brought this up either, because there's really not much material in terms of the description or anything. The only time I've heard of it is uh, the uh, cover of the of some magazine, I believe it was, uh, done uh, by uh, Andrei Atuchin, it's a part of very famous polio artist, he's very good as well. Uh, hey Andy, if you're watching, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he uh, he's done a cover, and it's a Tyrannosaurid, apparently, from Russia. But not described, and not given a name. We don't have a name for it, we don't have a good description, we don't really have a lot of remains, estimated to be either the size of Daspletosaurus or Tarbosaurus, which could be anywhere in between, we don't even know how much, because we just don't have enough material, but yeah. Uh, nice. Be that would be, that would fit right. Russia. We have a uh, Tarbosaurus in Mongolia, we wonder who is running a little further north up. Jujang. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I suspect largely just because it's just hard to get people out there. Uh, okay, well, in this case, we've reached the conclusion of this session, and uh, I uh, hope uh, you, Jason, had a good time. Yeah, no, this is great. Definitely need to do this again sometime. Awesome. And there's going to be a lot of stuff to talk about in the group chat as well after this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll bring, out the, bring on the, uh, the questions, people. Yep, definitely. And uh, also post your questions and follow up uh, comments, whatever you have, guys, the viewers as well, and the subs in, the, in here. And uh, we will definitely have something to chew on as a follow-up. So what we'll do is we'll just browse through them. Well, I myself personally, since I run the channel, Jason's got some, you know, papers to write. So, <laughs> but uh, I keep busy. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you also. We all have things to run of our own. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, thanks so much for watching. Uh, thank you for coming and making the time, Jay. I uh, wish you best of luck in whatever comes next, and I hope you keep us posted. Thank you for hosting. This is great. So, I will see you guys later. And uh, uh, if you want us to do anything specific, maybe you can request specific subjects. Post them in the comments, and we will answer. We always do. So, thanks for watching, guys. I've been AKRX. We had Dr. Jason Bork, and bye bye. Bye bye. bye.